All right, so we're going to continue in piping systems design. Last time, what did we cover? Hayes and Williams. Also, we covered last time the Hardy Cross. Hardy Cross for solving a loop. But in our loops, we just had uh, pressure drops from major losses. So let's solve a problem today dealing with uh, pumps and some heat exchangers and some valves as well as piping. So I thought I would just build this problem up slowly. So what I have is I have a chiller. And you may not be familiar with a chiller, but a chiller intakes warm water and comes out cold water. Uh, where does that energy go? Well, there's another loop of water up to a cooling tower to dump it to the atmosphere. You're eventually going to dump it to the atmosphere. But let's not worry about the extra loop up to the cooling tower and dumping the heat to the atmosphere. Heat is coming out of some water, and it's flowing. And now that chilled water, that's what comes out of a chiller, is ready to be used in a heat exchanger. So we have over here somewhere else a heat exchanger. And uh, that heat exchanger is part of an air handling unit. And uh, in the winter, not the winter, in the summertime, that chilled water provides the air conditioning into, let's say, a building. In this, on this campus, there's a bunch of chillers in a central location and a bunch of handler, air handlers with heat exchangers out throughout the campus multiple air handlers in each building. I don't know how many are in this one, but in the engineering building, which is a much smaller building, I think there's four, four air handlers, typically one per floor, where they'll put up one on the roof or something. So let's not just put it off to one heat exchanger, let's put it off to another heat exchanger. So we have two heat exchangers, and we want to provide chilled water to those heat exchangers, and the, the people lay out, and they say, well, Let's put a pump to help move it, the flow, and then we'll have to navigate and dig some trenches and put it around some buildings. And anyway, it comes up and it goes through the first heat exchanger. Then it's going to come out, needs to get back to the chiller. And this one will go to the second heat exchanger. Then it's going to come out. They'll join back up and route it back. So there's a layout. You're given this layout, and you're told that uh, the, the net length of the pipe from, let's say, this connection all the way down around through that chiller, through the pump, up to this point is uh, a, a 300 feet length of pipe. And we know that the flow is in that direction, and I'm going to have to number these things, so I'm going to say that's my first leg. I'm kind of mixing up some things, but it's a first leg. And then from this point through that first chiller going this way, I'm sorry, the heat exchanger, that would be maybe our, our uh, this is our first leg, and that would be our second leg. And that second leg has a total of um, 150 feet of length. And the third leg is from this point goes up, etc. goes through that second chiller and then goes to the joint, the no node. So that one is a 200 feet of length of pipe. So I could calculate my major losses. How would I calculate my major head losses in the straight run of pipe? I would just say F L over D times the velocity head. All right. Okay. Uh, we're given some information about the fluid that flows through. We'll need that, so we'll say the density is uh, 58 pound mass per cubic foot. And the viscosity, I'm just making up these, some of these numbers, 0013 uh, pound mass uh, per foot second. So that's our fluid that needs to be moved. And one of the key ideas is that this heat exchanger, when it's running full tilt, it needs to receive a Q of a flow rate of five cubic feet per second. That's typically what a heat engineer does in this building. They say our, our air handling unit on the warmest day needs to have that flow rate. And so you size everything for the maximum flow rate through your pipes. You don't want it to peter out on the hot day in August, right? Oh, sorry, air conditioning doesn't work on a hot day in August. 
No, 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 that's not acceptable. <laughs> and then for the flow to the next heat exchanger, you need a, a slightly more, it's eight cubic feet per second of water flow. You could put it in gallons per minute, whatever, let's just leave it in these units. CFS, cubic feet per second. Well, can you tell me what the flow is in the first pipe? If eight needs to go, and it's 13. It's 13 cubic feet per second. It's not too all uncommon for this to be the, the way that you have to do the design of a layout. <laughs> it, and you say, I need that flow, knowing that it's coming out this cold and it's gonna go back that warm, that's gonna provide so many tons of cooling and et cetera. Well, <clears throat> the way to control these things is you introduce a control valve in addition to the pump. And so there's a control valve and a control valve. And uh, this is, I don't want to get ahead of you, but a couple years ago they brought out VFDs and electronics to control electric motors. And so you can slow down electric motors very efficiently and every mechanical engineer specs electric. Uh, uh, variable frequency drives for every motor that goes into this type of application. And I'll tell you right now, it diminishes the use of the valves because the valve is just like a brake. How many people drive a car and you, let's say you have a foot on the brake and a foot on the gas? No, you don't want that. Get your foot off the brake and just give it the gas, right? Well, the pump is providing the head and everywhere there's a head loss, it's just energy. You have to push it through the pipe. Well, that's just the cost of doing business. Uh, push it through the heat exchanger. That's the cost of doing business. Pushing it across a partially closed valve, not so smart. It's, you're just wasting energy all the time. So as soon as they could get the VFDs to really be, um, to work with the high reliability, they were sucked into the designs and everybody uses them. So what they do is a variable frequency drive. This slows the motor down without burning it out. So normally, the pump, what used to be the, the motor ran at a certain RPM. It was a 3,600 RPM motor, and that's what it ran at. If you plugged it in, that's what it ran at. If you overloaded it, slowed it down more, you burned it out. If you tried to just reduce the voltage but not the uh, frequency of the alternating current to it, you'd burn it out. And you really can't change the frequency very easily. Um, it comes out of the wall 60 hertz. Anyway, so there it is. That's our problem. And the, we know our flow rates. So our goal is to have the velocity always less than a maximum 10 foot per second. That's often a good design criteria, depending because water that moves or any fluid moving through a system very fast, what do you know from your experience? Sometimes you can hear it. And in this building right here, let's say you're taking a test, do you really want to hear the air rushing through the duct system? No. And if there's water lines going through, do you want to hear that? No. If you're in an office space, et cetera. So basically, if you have high speeds, you have more noise. So low speeds, often for noise as well as erosion uh, of the pipe. So there is a design criteria right there. Now, the, also, you're given the performance of the chiller. So the chiller has a, a, a head loss in the chiller where it's a constant 0.08 times the flow rate squared. Oh, there's a lot of work going back to get that constant internal flow inside the chiller, et cetera. But for right now, it's given. That constant's given. And for the heat exchanger, each of those heat exchangers, it's 1.2 times the flow rate. All right, and for a valve, the head loss across the valve is some constant for the valve times the flow rate squared. It's very common, these head losses, we've seen that already in straight runs of pipe, it's primarily proportional to flow rate squared. Uh, but that loss coefficient for each of the valve can be different. One valve could be closed a little bit more than the other, but when they're fully open, when they're fully open, the loss coefficient's 0 0.03. So we know that the, the, the loss coefficient K for each of those valves is gonna be greater than or equal to the minimum of 0.03 when it's fully open. 
And if you start to close some of it, that K for that one valve goes up. So we have two valves, so you have to think about that. So uh, what you're asked to find is the pumping power. Pumping power. Okay, well, how are you going to find the pumping power? Well, to make this system work, if somebody said, I, I want you to calculate the pumping power, you'd say, I need this information. What information do you need? The pressure drop across the system that the pump has to supply or over overcome. So basically there's a pressure gain across the pump, isn't there? A pressure gain. And that gain is then lost as it goes in, around the circuit and the system. So the pressure gain of the pump is needed. What else do you need to know to calculate the power, the pumping power? Flow rate. Flow rate. So Here's our, question, our equation, W dot of the pump. That's our pumping power. You can calculate it one of three ways. It's always a product of some uh, gain, pressure gain, head gain, elevation head gain, or energy head gain, times some flow. Okay? So it's a product of head times flow. You could think of the flow being in uh, volume, uh, volume per unit time, mass per unit time, or weight per unit time. What's our symbol for the flow if our units for the flow are volume per unit time? Q, volumetric flow rate, cubic feet per second, looks good for that flow. How about what symbol is you often for mass per unit time? M dot, M dot. Don't ask me why I don't put a dot on the Q, but I put it on the M. Just leave that alone, okay? <laughs> but uh, they're both per unit time. And then the last one is really not an easy one, but it's a weight per unit time. I'm going to multiply M dot times something to get the weight flow rate. G, which is one pound force weight per one pound mass at the surface of the earth. That's G is my weight per unit mass ratio. So multiply by G and then that turns M dot into a weight flow rate. Now, what about the head? How about for the, the um, see, I need to multiply something energy per unit volume, multiply that volume per unit time. So I need this energy per unit volume. What is that for my head? That's my pressure. So the pressure gain times the volumetric flow rate will be an excellent way to calculate the pumping power. The other one, energy per unit mass. Hey, that's our traditional energy head. Yeah, energy head. So I like to use the symbol H, cap H gain, times M dot. And then energy per unit weight, that would be my lowercase hg across a pump. The pump is a gain, a gain, a gain. So it's a pressure increase across a pump times the volumetric flow rate. The head gain, the energy head gain across a pump times the mass flow rate. Or the elevation head gain across a pump times the weight flow rate. All of those will work. We're just going to pick one and, and run with it. We're going to try to work with this one. Uh, I wanted to change the color to red this one right here, okay? So let's do this. Um, can you get M dot or HG? Which one of those can you get pretty easily? M dot, right. It would be just Q through the pump. We just said that the Q through the pump is Q1, 13 cubic feet per second. And multiply that by the density of the fluid. And so this M dot uh, through the pump is just a row Q1. This Q1 is 13 cubic feet per second right over there. So that, that part's solved for, okay. Uh, what about the head gain that the pump needs to provide? Well, let's talk about it a minute. These valves are initially fully open, completely open, right? Your intuition, your insight into this problem. 
without turning the valve, either valve one, let's label this one, no, let's call this valve three because it's in our third leg, and this is valve two because it's in our second leg. Where's valve one? I don't have a valve one. It's not in there, okay? But let's say I didn't do anything to those valves and I just turned the pump on and let it run. Do you think you're going to get perfectly 5 CFS in leg two and eight in the, sec in the other leg? No. So what are you going to have to do when you start running it? You're going to have to go over there and start turning down the valve. Let me play with your insight a little bit. Let's say you turn down valve two, left valve three completely open. Turn down valve two until you got perfectly Q2 is five cubic feet per second. Okay? And then you run up to the next floor or the next building and you start playing with the third valve and you start closing it off. Do you think the valve, do you think the flow in leg two is going to stay at five cubic feet per second? It will not. So as you close one of the valves, it affects the other flow. Let me play with your insight a little bit here. Let's leave valve three completely open. I go and I start to close valve two. The pump is running right now. What will the flow in valve in, in the leg three, what will Q3 do as I start to close valve two? Will it go up or go down or stay the same? It'll go up, it'll go up. See that? You're restricting it to, through leg two, hence it's gonna push it over to leg three. So how, how am I gonna find this perfect uh, locate, this balancing. How, how much do I need to close valve two and valve three to get it balanced? And what would be the calculation? How do I calculate it? Let's do it in Excel. I hope you have good numbers because I'm gonna add stuff in Excel, but I'm not gonna click back and forth going back here. Hey, what was my K for the chiller? The K for the chiller is 0.08. What's the K of each heat exchanger? 1.2. What's the minimum K of the valve? 0.03, okay? Uh, what is my density? 58. What's my viscosity? 0.0013, right? I'm gonna put them into Excel, start using it. But before I jump there, before I leave this, I'm probably gonna do something like a Hardy Cross, but it's not Hardy Cross. But I'm gonna have a loop because for things to be balanced, what happens if I go in a loop, this loop right here, right here, isn't that a loop? We'll call that loop one. And in our Excel code, we're going to do the equivalent of what you did in electrical uh, circuits. You're going to do Kirchhoff's, not current, voltage law. So here you could think about, oh, we'll still say Kirchhoff. But it's not voltage, it's head law. How do you like that? It's not voltage because voltage in electric is what pushed things through, right? But then it also you had voltage drops when you had resistance to flow through the parts of the network, right? Here, well, we have head gain because the pump is pushing it, and we're going to have head loss. So when I find I'm going to have to balance this system depending on how big a pump I have, what the valve is, and the characteristics of the heat exchanger and that, such that this, this is true. So around the loop one, the sum of the head losses has to equal the sum of the head gains. Or if you want to say losses are negatives and gains are positive, the sum of the heads is zero. Something like that, true? And then we have another loop, and this loop is just going to be this way. And that's loop two, just like we did for Hardy Cross. But this is really where we're going to get to having the balance system where it actually works. It satisfies this head law, the Kirchhoff's head law. I'm just making up Kirchhoff's head law there. All right. One other thing I need to do before I leave this is I want to talk about a connection matrix because we're going to use that in Excel. How many loops do I have? Loop one and loop two. How many 
legs or segments do I have? I have one, two, and three. Okay? And in this, I put either a zero if that leg isn't in the loop, or I put a positive one if that leg in my assumed direction of flow in that leg is in that positive direction, the same as that a loop or not. So what would this connection matrix look like? So what about let loop one, leg one? One. How about loop one, leg two? Is, it in the, is loop one going in the direction of leg two? This is the direction of leg two. This is the direction of leg one. That's the direction of leg three, right? One. How about leg three? Zero. All right. How about now for loop two? Zero. Negative one. One. Make sense? Okay, let's jump to Excel. Let me just start putting in things like uh, density. RHO, 58, and I want to remind myself LBM per foot cubed. Mu for the viscosity, 0 0.0013. LBM divided by foot second two. All right. The roughness of the pipe epsilon or roughness and for a steel pipe it's 0 0.0015 and it's foot okay how many legs do I have so I'm gonna have leg one leg two leg three and I'm gonna have the length of that leg sometimes I'll put it like this length and then I'll put what the unit is below it either way uh, so the first leg is 300 foot, true. What's the second leg? 150 feet. And what's the third leg? 300 or 200 feet. All right. Uh, the next one would be maybe a diameter in inches. And I like to maybe make those uh, in the middle so I can read it a little better. All right. I don't know what diameter inch. I'm just going to pick 10 inch, 10 inch, 10 inch, right? And then I know that Excel is helpful in the sense of avoiding errors. A lot of it's just by saying take that number, divide by 12, and drag that formula down. And there it is. That's converted right away. And maybe I need the area in a minute in foot squared. And that's equal to uh, pi times the diameter squared divided by 4. Did I do that formula correct? I hope so. I get the areas there. And I know what is the f volumetric flow rate that I needed in each of those pipes in cubic foot per second. Well, in leg 1, I needed 13. In leg 2, I needed 5. In leg three, I needed eight, and you can double check your math, but this really allows me to calculate the velocity in foot per second, doesn't it? And so I take the volumetric flow rate, divide by the area. I'm sorry, this is a five right there, thank you. And we'll drag that down. So now, sizing the pipe, what do you think? 10 inch going to work? Look at the velocity. What was our criteria for velocity? Less than 10 foot per second. Uh, how about 18 inch pipe? That'll work. Um, how about 16 inch pipe? That'll work too. So let's go with the 16 inch pipe. Um, how about a 15 and a half? You can't buy it. So let's just ignore it, right? And then uh, I'm sorry? No, oh, this one's too high right there, right? So that'll work for the 10. What do we need to do here? Maybe try a 12. That may work. Uh, probably go with a 14 and avoid the callback on noise. Okay? I mean, this is engineering. <laughs> okay. So there you go. Uh, now, that helps us size it. We have our, our, uh, our uh, pipe diameters in inches. Okay. 
Now, what I need to do is I need to put in a connection matrix. I'm going to do it like this. I'll say this is my C matrix. And I'm going to put in for loop 1 and for loop 2. We just worked through that. What was our connection matrix? It was 1, 1, 0, true. It was 1, negative 1, 0. I'm going to tighten things up, otherwise you won't be able to see anything. Maybe that's too tight, huh? <laughs> uh, we don't need this many digits on the area. Then tighten it up. All right. <clears throat> Maybe I probably should put foot per second one more digit there. Volumetric flow rate. There you go. Now, how do I calculate the Reynolds number? It's going to be dimensionless, isn't it? And there's a bunch of equations you can use. Rho V D over mu. You can use 4 M dot over pi D mu. You can use 4 whatever Q over pi D nu. You, you have to be able to calculate the Reynolds number correctly. So uh, put the density. When I'm going to use density, I'm going to drag that formula down. You stay grabbing the density in C1. All right. The density times velocity times diameter divided by the mu and I need that not change dollar dollar does that make sense and I when I look at this I always try to put it in the scientific so it's 5 times 10 to the fifth and it's turbulent got the, got the density Relative roughness, EPS divided by DIA, and that's dimensionless. And so go get this here, make sure it's... Does anybody know the trick? I, I used to know that trick. F4. F4? Thank you. I'll try that. Let me try it right now. Okay. Put that, then do F4. <laughs> There's a big smile on my face. Oh, that looks good, doesn't it? All right, and then we divide by the diameter in feet, and there's our relative roughness. We drag that formula down. Now we're going to get the friction factor. It's dimensionless, is it not? So what is the friction factor? Friction Churchill, that's right. And if you can remind yourself, just come up here and click. I need the relative roughness, which is this cell. And for the Reynolds number, I need that cell. And away you go, and you calculate it. And we'll drag that down. And we'll clean up a little bit on the units. That's a lot of digits, but we'll leave it there. All right, this is a lot of digits, too. And we'll just leave it there. Now, I needed the F so I could get the major loss, so the head loss major. What do you mean by major? Straight run. Straight run of pipe. How do I calculate that and what are the units? Let me do this. Isn't it F, friction factor, times length divided by diameter times velocity head. And I'm going to click a cell right over here because I forgot to Im compute my velocity head. So I'm going to insert and I'm going to put head. Okay, I'm going to do two of them here because this is error prone. I'm going to do here, I'm going to do head velocity and I'm going to cal calculate it in two units, foot squared per second and foot pound force per pound mass and they're numerically not the same. The velocity head in energy per unit mass is just v squared over 2. That's all it is. So it's equal to this velocity squared divided by 2. And I didn't leave enough room, so move that over. There you go. So that's our velocity head. Okay. Did I do that correctly? v squared divided by 2? Thumbs up? Okay. But now I want it in those units. Divide by 
and it's just you're using the conversion factor that one pound mass accelerating at 32.2 foot per second squared is one pound force or one pound force required. All right, so I divide by 32.2. And so there is our velocity head. And again, I just, I, I know this is error prone for me. I suspect it's error prone for you, but there's that head. That, it's like our dynamic pressure in fluids. That's what it is, just like that. So now I can come over here and I was working on this equation and I want that in these units. And so there you go. So our head uh, major loss is going to be this energy per unit mass. Okay. So now we've calculated our frictional loss. Um, let's clean up some digits here. Too many digits. Good. Uh, what about uh, some other losses? What about our, our head loss associated with the chiller? Okay, well, first of all, I got to find some place to put some information. I'm going to do it. You can put it somewhere else. I'm going to say the K of the chiller, which I'm just going to tuck it right there, was uh, 0 0.08. True? Okay. So, I need that head in these units. Um, it's equal to the loss coefficient, F4. Look at that, it holds it right there, right? Good. Times the velocity head right there. Isn't that our head loss across that chiller? Do we can drag that down? Okay, where, oops, you know what? Where did we have the chiller? Did we have it in leg one? Yes. Did we have it in leg two? Nope. And leg three? Nope. So it's only in leg this, these are the legs, right? Leg one, leg two, leg three. Okay, so that's our head loss of the chiller, and there's only one chiller, and it's only leg one. Okay, what about the heat exchangers? K of the heat exchangers. What was that K for the heat exchangers? 1.2. And so now we're going to do head loss in the heat exchangers, same units. And there's nothing in leg one, there's no heat exchanger. But in leg two, what do we have? We're gonna have that times our velocity head going through leg two. That makes sense? And then we'll do the same, it's the same. If you had a different one, we're gonna have to do that in a minute right now. Let me clean this up. Okay, um, I knew I'd run out of room. You see a way to tighten it up, any? Yeah. Collapse the legs, they're a lot better, thank you. Let's do this one, get this over. And diameter and feet is way too thick, big, thank you, thank you, thank you. Maybe even more, there. Okay, this is too big. Now, I struggle with how to calculate the head loss in the valve. And I, at first I put up one valve coefficient, but then I realized, you know what? The K for the valve changes. First of all, there's no valve in the first leg. And the second leg has a valve, and its minimum was 0 0.03. That's like a starting value, 0 0.03. And the second one's 0.03. But these I'm going to use to balance the system numerically as well as what I talk about physically. They're going to change. If I go and change the valve, it goes up a little bit. And to balance the system, those are going to change, okay? So let's say I start this one at 0.05. They're independent. They can be different values. Okay. So how do I calculate that head loss? Well, first of all, there's nothing there for the first leg, the head loss of the valve. I do want it in these units, so I just copy those over. Okay, so now it's going to be this loss coefficient times the velocity head right there in that leg. 
and the same formula down. Did that make sense? I need to do the head gain and uh, from the pump, let me put H gain. And uh, I want it in that units because everything I'm working in those units, there's only a pump right there. Maybe it puts in, I don't know, 40 units, foot pound force per pound mass gain right there. Um, but there's no pump and no pump right there. This is, I'm gonna have to calculate it. That's varying, true? Okay, so let's do this. I need to screw over some more. Maybe I'll do this. Come over here, view, split it. And then what you can do is scroll. Ah. Something like that. Okay, <clears throat> a student showed me that. I didn't learn it on myself. If you find anything that I'm doing awkward, you come show me, preferably in my office so I can practice <laughs> because uh, it's really hard. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say the, uh, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna sum the head losses through, that, through each of the leg. For the, the leg one, don't we have the head loss due to, let me just do this sum, if you have the major, you have a chiller, no valve, um, and then I have to close that and add this because I skipped that column, right? So there is my, <laughs> all right. How about for this one? Let me just do it by hand. I have a major loss. I, I don't have a chiller, but I'll put that in there in case I add a chiller somewhere. And I have the heat exchanger loss and then the valve loss. Anyway, this is just like the other one. So you see what we're doing there. And tighten this up and close that up a little bit. All right. What about the uh, head gains? Some head gain. Well, there's only one head gain and it's only in the pump and it's already done right there. 40. I'm going to do head loss for that. And so it'll be this minus that. And we'll go down. And all we're saying is if it ran and it put in 40 here, it puts in 30. That if you went that way, there wouldn't be a net head loss in leg one. There'd be a head gain of 23. But there would be a loss of 7 and a loss of 4.3 in the other two legs. All right. But now I need to check the loop. And the loop, oh boy, I have to kind of go, maybe I can do this way. Let me scroll over. Is I need that matrix right there, that connection matrix. But I'm trying to uh, check that the... Yeah, the sum of the pressure losses around the loop is equal to zero. So um, the, uh, you're going to have two of them because there's two loops. And you could do it with a matrix multiply if you like, or you can do it with a dot product. Either one will work. Um, let's do it with, uh, let me do this one. So for loop loop one it's a sum product what is that that's like a dot product give me an array all right i'm going to give you the, the coefficients right here which says check yes add leg one add leg two but don't do anything with leg three that multiplies the net around and so for those current operating conditions it's not balanced this is not balanced. That needs to be zero. Loop two. Okay, what is that? Sum product of the second comma with this. And you close and away you go. 
Well, if both of those need to be equal to zero, you square and sum both of those terms. And if that's not zero, you try to minimize it. That'll drive both of those terms to zero. I want to take this, square it, add to that, squared, and I want to drive that to zero. So to drive that to zero, I have to know what I'm going to be changing. Let's do this first. Let's only change the pump head gain. Now let's try that. I'm going to come up to data. I'm going to go, I'm going to just go to, you can do what if, but let's go solver. And I don't like how big this box is, but it's because I selected that, it says the objective, that cell in Y6, I want to minimize, not maximize, minimize it by changing this cell right here. And so I'm going to go ahead and scroll up so I can hit solve. <laughs> and it tried to do it. It didn't get it to zero, did it? Okay. But if you were sitting there and saying, leave both of these valves, oops, I should have left this valve fully open, 0.03. If you say, leave both of these valves fully open and run that pump, that pump will run and you'll develop that much head, but you won't have the balance because you really wanted to get that much flow rate. What you have to do is you have to go tweak those valves. So go back to solver and say, yeah, the same function minimum, but not just change that one, but change that one, comma, change that one. I can have three things I'm going to change to try and minimize it. Well, what do you think? I need to put in there a restriction, but I wanted to put in 0.03 somewhere, and that's my minimum, right? Now I can do the objective, so I can come over here and say I want to minimize that, minimize it. I'm going to be changing all those three things, but this uh, constraint right here I think is correct. Let me just do it. Let me do another add. And that cell has to be greater than or equal to that cell. True? We'll add it. All right. <clears throat> well, it did it, finally. So basically, it minimized that. And that valve was set at its minimum. And this valve was significantly closed and increased, wasn't it? And so it's now balanced. The flows, we sort of forced them to be what they were back there. And now we were playing with the head gain across the pump. This is it. And then that. So what is the power? Um, let's do W dot. If we multiply the head gain times the flow rate, can you see what units we'll get? We'll get. We need to multiply the density, right? Don't we need the density? I got to go find the density right there and there. And what will the units on this be? Foot pound force per second. That's not all that convenient of a unit, so I'll convert it to another set of units. Put it like this, uh, we'll convert to horsepower. And so we'll take that and divide by 550. So we need 18 horsepower. That's what's going to be needed. Now, that's what gets into the fluid. If you have a pump that's not that efficient, then you need to provide more than 18.55 horsepower shaft power to it. And if the electric motor, then you need to provide you just back up your efficiencies to the original power source that you have to check. Okay, let's do this. Somebody uh, says that's a great scheme, but um, look at how much you're wasting. Um, if I come over, I, I want to add something right here. Insert. I'm going to do uh, the power W in the valves. Okay. Well, this is the valve that's really the one in the third leg. It's that 
um, that head loss across the valve times the flow rate through the valve times the mass density divided by 550, 2.4 horsepower are, is being perpetually squandered. So I'm feeding 19 horsepower and 2.4 is perpetually being squandered. And there was some other errors that I had made um, and sorry about that. I did not need to multiply by the velocity head. I needed to multiply by, can I get it over there? Come on, bring it across. Q squared. So, split screen. See if I can see that now. Um, come back here to this uh, chiller. And that is multiplied by Q squared. So that changes that number some. Let me uh, undo that and take a look. So it went from 1.04 to uh, 13.52, quite a bit of change. <laughs> um, let's take a look at the head loss across each of those heat exchangers. Basically, it's not multiplying by the velocity head, but the Q quantity squared. And that was a big change as well. We'll drag this down. These are going to change the number significantly. And let's see, the K of the valve is right there, escape. And the head, not the velocity head, again, it was needs to multiply by the flow in cubic feet per second, quantity squared. And we'll drag this down. Big, 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 big change. So the first thing to do is to go ahead and balance the loops. So we'll come back here and we'll hit solver. And in solver, we want to minimize the cell Y3 by changing the cell here for the head gain in the pump, primary pump. And we could change either one of these. And it's subject to the constraint that R7 is greater than R3, so 0.03 is greater than that. So the, the valve is, is uh, uh, greater than the minimum value. Let's go ahead and hit solve. It looks like it did drive it to a minimum over here. You can see that. So it does look good. Here, let's take a look. We have to put in the restriction that this valve is set to 0.03. So great. So we have to do both of those. Let's go back to solver. And put it over here so you can see it a little bit. Yeah, hard to see. So we're going to add a restriction that this cell right here is greater than or equal to this value up here. So we'll go ahead and add it and click OK. Let's go ahead and click OK. So we did get both of them in there. Started at 0.03. And let's go ahead and start this one at 0 0.03. All right, let's go and hit uh, Solver. And we see that we're going to minimize R8. Uh, that's the objective function. That's not the objective. This is the objection function, Y6. We want to minimize it. We're going to change uh, T6, R7, and R8. Yep, they're all highlighted. Subject to these two constraints. Look good. Let's hit Solve. And it does look it drove to a minimum. It looks OK. And so it does actually choke down valve 2. So valve 2 and leg 2 is the one that uh, gets uh, the res added restriction. So with that, let's go to, so valve 2 is partially closed 
and valve three is fully open. And so in order to um, help minimize the head loss, what we'll do is we'll add a pump, add a pump in the third leg, pump right there. Let's jump back to the Excel. All right. So after making those corrections, we find that the power is 140 horsepower, uh, which is extremely high. Um, and what we have here is that C1 needs to be a dollar, dollar, good, good. Hit enter. And then we found that the horsepower wasted across that partially closed second valve is 25 horsepower and there's 140 horsepower. I'm going to take a look for these conditions. The head loss um, is uh, dominated by the head losses. Um, not, well, a lot is across that heat exchanger, a little bit across the chiller, a little bit there. Looks like it's primarily across those heat exchangers. Their uh, loss coefficient, K of uh, 1.2, seems to be a little high. And this valve has quite a bit too. So taking a look, you can see quite a bit of power is spent just forcing it across that uh, closed, partially closed valve. All right, so now what you can do is uh, go back and uh, instead of just having one pump and a partially closed second valve, valve in the second line, valve 2, what we can do is we can try to leave valve 2 as open as possible and put a pump into line 3. And so that's what we want to do right now, put a pump into line 3. So we'll come over here. And where did we have the pump before? We had it only here in line 1. And now we want to add a pump in line 3. We want to start the valves as being as fully open as possible. Maybe we start this one at, I don't know, uh, 10. Uh, this too many digits. Let's uh, clean that up a little bit. Something like that. Okay, so we're going to uh, minimize the error here in our sum of the uh, head losses and gains around each of these loops. So we'll minimize this blue cell by changing uh, both the, the, the primary pump head gain as well as the head gain in the third leg. And we'll try to leave these valves open. Um, we definitely can leave this valve open in the third leg. We don't need to close it. So let's try it with the two pumps first. So we'll go up to data solver. So we're looking at this Y6, minimize it, subject to changing. And now we take a look. Let me back up and cancel some of these. And so we see that it's cell T6, comma, and cell T8. And these subject constraints, they're going to be obeyed. So let's just go ahead and leave it alone. We'll go ahead and say solve and see how well it does. Well, it does pretty good. It drives this blue cell, but we're trying to drive it to zero, and it did real well. And what we find, let me do OK and accept this. Get this out of the way here. Clean these digits up. Is that the primary pump was 56.1, and the secondary pump, 45.7. So the, the pump in the third leg is very big. So um, if I come over here and I just drag down the power, it's not just the first, but it's also um, the, uh, the, uh, the first pump needs 77 horsepower and 38. So what is the sum of the horsepowers equal to? It's uh, this plus this, which is 115. And we find that uh, these valves are fully open, and so there's minimal uh, power 
just pushing it across a fully open valve that that's a loss just so, and so there's it consumes less power so let's go ahead and uh, stop there but this would be the answer it's black with this type of color code so that's how many horsepower uh, the sum of the two motors have to put in okay with that I'll go ahead and stop